Amen. Please be seated. I'm Flynn. I'm the associate pastor here at Truth Point, and it's my honor to lead us in the responsive reading. The responsive reading is found in uh, Romans 22, verses 1 through 10, and it's in your worship guide. These words were penned by King David, but they were fulfilled in the life of the King of Kings, in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Let us read these words. I'll read the, um, the light-colored words. You'll read the bold, and then we'll read the last uh, section together. Psalm 22, verses 1 through 10. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Amen. Please stand as we continue to worship our Lord in song, the Rock of Ages. Amen. Before you have a seat, please turn and greet your neighbor for the peace of Christ. We'll start our sermon in about a minute.
All right, you're free to take your seat whenever you'd like. You know, at least two people this evening, when I saw them, said, Pastor Matt, good to see you. Happy Good Friday. I said, wait, what are we supposed to say? What are we supposed to say on Good Friday? I said, that's a good point. You know, Good Friday? Not really sure. And it, uh, it brings to mind that, you know, it's a debated thing as to how this day, uh, the Friday before Easter, became known as Good Friday in the English language. In other languages, it has other adjectives that, that don't necessarily align with the English word good. One theory on how it got its name in English is that the original meaning long ago in English of the word good was holy. They were synonymous. Kind of in a similar sense to when Jesus said to the rich young ruler, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone, meaning only God is that kind of good, truly good. Only God is truly holy. This week is called Holy Week by, uh, by many Christians, and each of the other days of the week carry that adjective before it. Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday, tomorrow is Holy Saturday. Even Maundy Thursday, not Monday Thursday, Maundy Thursday goes by another name, which is Holy Thursday. Likewise today, the fifth, uh, the fifth day of the week, the day that the church especially commemorates the day on which the Son of God was nailed to a Roman cross, lifted off the ground, and crucified for the sins of his people, his, is known in our language as Good Friday. Good and Holy Friday. It was, in a very real sense, the most uniquely holy day the world has ever known. See, in the worship of God in the Old Testament, God's holiness was was illustrated and uh, displayed more than, I would say, any of his other attributes. From the ceremonial washings to the cleanliness laws to the blood of the sacrifices, the thread tying all of it together, all of that activity was God's holiness. God was holy, and his people were called to be holy. As you know, Jesus was crucified on a hill called Calvary or Golgotha, just outside the city of Jerusalem. Located inside the city was the temple, and in the innermost part of the temple was the most holy place or the Holy of Holies, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. There was a curtain that separated it, the most holy place, from the next holy place, and it was there in the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place, where the Shekinah glory of the Lord dwelled. The high priest was able to enter there, the most holy place, only once a year, one day, on the Day of Atonement. No one else would ever, would ever be so close to the glory of the holy God. And whenever we speak of such things, of God's holiness in particular, it's impossible for us to really understand what we're talking about unless we do so against the backdrop of sin, specifically our sin. If there was an opposite to holiness, it is sinfulness. And in order to apprehend the cross of Jesus Christ, in order for Good Friday to be good news, what we need to see together is how holiness and sin are presented to us and resolved on this day. And so that's what we're going to talk about briefly in our time together. If you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23 from the English Standard Version. You'll find it printed for you in the worship guide. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you please be seated? Tonight, we're going to briefly consider together the question, why is Good Friday good? Why is it holy? And you'll see our outline printed on the back of the worship guide. First, it is Good Friday because God is present in his glory. Again, in the Old Testament, God's holiness, his presence, had to be mediated. It was mediated through a high priest, which God appointed especially for that purpose, to to represent man going before God. God was too holy for all the people to behold. He would consume them. He was too holy for the other priests as well. They could not bear to be in his presence. And as mentioned earlier, even the high priest would only go into the the innermost part of the tabernacle and later the temple, and only one day a year on the Day of Atonement. And even on that day, he could not merely enter, but he had to go through a rigorous amount of ritual cleansing, cleansing of himself in order to prepare himself for that moment. From the time that the high priest awoke On that day, on the Day of Atonement, he would begin washing himself and going through preparation, prayers for himself as well as for the people. And that would be after the night before when the other priests would be with him, praying with him, reading psalms to him in a way trying to keep him from thinking of himself or to keep him from sinning in some way. According to Talmudic writings on the practices of the priests of that time, two two millennia ago, the high priest would take five different baths from head to toe on the Day of Atonement, and he would perform an additional ten ceremonial washings of his hands and his feet. And the people of Israel were so concerned that their representative would be ritually clean on that one day that he would go into the most holy place that they would actually watch him bathe from behind a curtain. They needed to be assured, it seems, that the one man from their number who got to meet behind the curtain with God on that one day a year, was doing so in the most ritually pure and cleanest ways imaginable, right? Now, when Jesus came, according to the first chapter of the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, when Jesus came, he brought God's glory to us. He was Emmanuel, God with us. On Good Friday, the Word who became flesh came to do the great work that he had covenanted with the Father and the Holy Spirit before he made the world that he would do, that he would enter history and give his life to redeem God's people, that he himself would die and would be the peace between God in his holiness, in his glory, and us in our sinfulness. He himself, the son of glory, was present on Good Friday in glory. And this day is good because he is here. So that's the first reason why Good Friday is good second reason is because God is dealing with sin in his holiness. Again, in the Old Testament, sacrifices were were commanded uh, to be offered on account of the sins of God's people. Now, as we are told in the New Testament, the blood of animals never really took away their sin. They could never finally atone for God's uh, people, Israel's sin. Uh, The daily and perpetual nature of the sacrifices illustrated this. They did not fully satisfy for the sins of the people. They They were preparatory. They were pointing forward to the only fitting sacrifice to do that, and that is the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus himself. I don't know if you've ever read it, or studied it, but uh, there's a wonderful 16th century document entitled uh, the Heidelberg Catechism. It uh, explains biblical doctrine in the form of question and answer, and it explains this concept of what we're talking about in this way. The question is, can there be found anywhere one who is a mere creature 
able to satisfy for us. It's talking about the satisfaction for our sins. And the question is, is there anyone who's a mere creature who's able to satisfy for our sin? And this is the answer, according to Heidelberg. None. For first, God will not punish any other creature for the sin which man has committed. And further, no mere creature can sustain the burden of God's eternal wrath against sin so as to deliver others from it. That is, if a man dies for his sins, he only dies for his sins. There is no mere man who is able to die in a sufficient manner to satisfy for the sins of other, of others. Well, on that Friday, on that hill, on that cross, someone came who was very God of very God from all eternity, and at the same time, one who was truly man. And he came not in shadow nor in type, but in true fulfillment of all the promises about God's redemption. And on the cross, on Good Friday, the wrath of true holiness towards sin was poured upon him. You know, when, uh, when the truly bad guy gets what's coming to him in a movie, there's a sense of, uh, of relief or even exuberance. When the guy who did something like murder or stole or terrorized gets justice, there's, uh, there's meant to be a, a natural comfort that does not need to be defended or really explained, right? The, the bad guy got justice. That's good, right? That's what we want. Like when Scar tumbled off the rock in The Lion King, there is a sense of, of completion, right? He murdered Mufasa. He lied about it. He ruined the circle of life, and so on. And I'm sorry if you were going to go and watch that tonight, and I just ruined it for you, parents. But, but there's a sense of relief when justice happens in the face of evil. And I think that we feel this in real life, too, not just in entertainment. When we consider the, the injustice around the world, the wickedness that we see, that we see more so than ever now because of technology, right? We all have a sense of longing, one, for it to end, but two, for it to be righted, right? We want justice to, to rain down from heaven. Well, Good Friday is good because the only whole, holy God, the one true God who is perfectly holy dealt with perfect justice on all your sin. And he dealt with it once and for all. No more forbearance. No more patience. On that cross, true judgment was made and justice rained down from heaven so that we never need to wonder, was this sin paid for? Did God really know about that sin, this secret sin, this hidden sin? We don't need to wonder that because, because perfect justice rained down from heaven, but it didn't rain down on you, though you deserve it. It didn't rain down on me, though I earned it. It rather rained down in perfect justice on the Son of God in your stead, him, not you. Accounts were made whole that day, and they were made whole by a holy God. God dealt with sin in his holiness on that day. Third and finally, the reason Good Friday is good is because we are alive in the presence of his holiness. Why all the careful attention paid to God's commandments about the temple and the curtain and the sacrifices and the most holy place? It is because... And we know this from Old Testament accounts of this very thing. If they were not followed, those guilty would die immediately. Again, examples of this throughout the Old Testament. Those who wanted to approach the perfect God of holiness on their own terms and not his, and they perished. God is holy, friends. He is he's holy. When the people of Israel were about to enter the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and Moses was not himself able to enter because of his own sin, he delivered to them on the plains of Moab a series of sermons preparing them to enter the land. It is the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, which literally means second law or retelling of the law. And in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, 
Moses lists out the Ten Commandments again and the story of when all those years before God had met with Moses on the mountain and he had brought down the Ten Commandments with them. And and he retells the story of, of what the people said to him after he went down that second time and gave them that second uh, set of two stone tablets. And this is what it says in Deuteronomy 5, 24 through 27. This is what Moses is saying. The people said to him after he got down from the mountain. The people said to Moses, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still lives. So they're singing the praises, right? Listen, this is Deuteronomy 5.25. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of fire as we have, and has still lived? said to Moses, go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say and speak to us and all that the Lord our God will speak to you and we will hear and do it. What they were saying to Moses was, we lived once while hearing the voice of the Holy God and we we don't think we could ever do it again. Okay? You go on our behalf. They They feared that they could not bear to hear the holiness of the Lord's voice. And so they begged Moses to mediate between them, to stand in between them and the holiness of God, lest they die. Well, listen, the holiness of God was fully present on Good Friday at the cross, and he truly dealt with sin on that day, and yet the people survived. How? How was that so? Well, this is the account of the crucifixion of Christ and how it's concluded by the gospel writer Luke in chapter 23 of his gospel. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, He praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. As he breathed his last, the world was black. The sun was receiving divine punishment for sin. The sun of the sky was hidden as the Son of God was condemned. A pagan soldier could not help exclaiming that in this sea of wickedness, this twisted theater of sin that took place on that Good Friday, there was but one who was innocent, but one who was holy, and only he died. Only he died. And the curtain restraining the white, hot, Holiness of God was torn from top to bottom. It's as if the holy hand of God reached down and ripped it apart. How did the people survive? It was because of the work of the sun. It was because the sun drank to the dregs the cup of God's wrath for sin, as Isaiah had foretold. The cup was dry of it. He had drank it to its dregs. I'll take it all for you, is what he did. So what was left for his people? What was left for the people of God after the Son of God took the punishment for their sin? Listen, his holy mercy. Christian, oh my, that is all that is left for you. God always looks at you through the holiness of his mercy. He will never punish you for the sins that Christ died for. And so every time we approach God in prayer, we are to have confidence that because Christ died on that Good Friday, we won't. More than that, we will live. Now, as it says in Hebrews 10, that's as I read earlier, now we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. We have confidence to enter the holy places of Jesus. We are called to draw near and live and worship because he died for us. 
No more fear of punishment. We do not go with a sacrifice of blood to appease his wrath. We go empty-handed but with thankful hearts, don't we? Because Jesus has died for us. Now we are called to be assured. We are given a command in our passage to be assured of God's love for us because of the blood spilled by the great high priest. And it has been, that blood has been sprinkled upon us by faith. Now we are called to hold fast to the confession of his death, not to improve upon it, nor to add our works to it as if it was anything less than the full and final payment for our sins. Everything we do is, as a re- is out of a response of a grateful heart. It is not adding to his perfect sacrifice. God truly and finally dealt with sin on that Good Friday. Dr. Greg Lanier is a professor from RTS Orlando. Uh, he's a wonderful teacher, and I recommend to it, uh, all of his writings to you wholeheartedly. He has an article up on the Gospel Coalition website on the significance of the curtain being torn when Jesus died from top to bottom. Uh, It's a short and accessible read. I I highly recommend it to you if you have a couple minutes this weekend. Greg Lanier, Temple, Curtain, Torn. You Google that, you'll find it. In the article, he writes that the tearing of the curtain accomplished three things. It signified, it's a sign, judgment on the temple system. God said, no more, no more sacrifices, no more blood. I've received the perfect one. Secondly, it symbolizes, it symbolized new access to the Father in Christ, that we are, are, have more confidence to approach the Father because of what the Son has done. Third and finally, it marked Christ's entrance into the heavenlies, that Christ was going to the true temple, never to die again, In his concluding thought, Lanier wrote, On Good Friday, the tearing of the earthly temple's curtain as Jesus died was a copy of a heavenly reality. When Jesus went through the curtain above to present his body in the heavenly sanctuary, the earthly veil is torn, the heavenly veil is opened, our anchor holds within the veil. You see, my friends, Good Friday is good because a holy God was there, fully knowing, gazing at, and dealing with and judging our sin, and we survived. More than survived. Because of Jesus taking our punishment, we are alive, fully and finally and forever alive, not simply here on earth as if the work of Christ was just to make our lots in life a little, a little more tolerable in the few short years we live on this earth. More than that, it is not in this life only that our hope is, is not in this life that our hope is truly realized. No, Jesus presented his blood on the altar of heaven and says, this has paid for the sins of my people. They will be here with me as surely as I am here. No more justice from heaven to rain down on you, Christian, for it poured down entirely upon him on that holy and good day. Believe it, hide in it, and rest in it. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you that the Son came, knowing fully who we are, knowing that, that we have nothing that you need, that, you, that we don't add anything to who you are, Lord. Out of the abundance of your love and mercy, you sent Christ to die for us on that first Good Friday. Oh, Lord, increase our faith in him. Lord, increase our dependence upon him and fill us up by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we conclude our service in song?
receive the holy God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And we know we have peace because Christ died for us. Amen. Go in his peace. Have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you resurrection Sunday morning.